and welcome everyone to this week's maternity midwifery hour and i'm back in my proper place i loved last week i must say but i also love looking after you as a chair now my name's sue mcdonald um, and welcome to you if it's your first time watching a special welcome i'm the curator for the maternity and midwifery hour and the maternity and midwifery festivals and it's my delight to be chairing this evening's session with stephanie michaelides who's with me here now we always have this thing and um, of, of putting our speakers on the spot and asking them for their moment of the week but i'm going to just maybe say say my moment of the week and then that'll make stephanie feel as though because she's got lots and lots of moments and it's probably very difficult to choose one now my moment of the week is i actually managed to carve a pumpkin never done it before but someone told me if you don't put your little pumpkin outside the door nobody comes and knocks at your door and i bought all these sweeties for, for the children and everything so i thought i'm gonna have to carve this pumpkin and i carved it with my sharp knife didn't cut myself it's not the most handsome pumpkin in the world but it was pretty good lit it with a little candle and i had a procession of children luckily with their parents in the background i really like that for a safety point of view with these little tiny ones coming to pick out their little sweets and then the bigger children as it got later and later and we ran out of sweeties and I had to close down my little pumpkin and then put it away safely because it's not necessarily good for wildlife. Now, Stephanie was talking to me yesterday when we were talking about this session and she did say she was really delighted to be with us this evening. So perhaps could that be your moment of the week, Stephanie? That definitely is my moment. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to this. Excellent. Thank you, Sue. Because I know Stephanie does watch the show quite a lot. So it's really lovely that you can come to be with us. So I'm going to do the usual sort of things that I do. Just remind people who are, are coming maybe for the first time or some of the people who've been our regular people of where we came from. The maternity hour, I mean, not anything else. Um, we started in the pandemic and I think the pandemic is probably quite close to a lot of people's minds at the moment in the UK because of the um, COVID inquiry going on. But one of the things that hit us when we started was we've been doing lots of conferences and, and study sessions and things. And all of a sudden, with the lockdown, everything had to stop. And we were very, very conscious that it was a very busy, scary time for midwives, for student midwives, trying to get information, trying to keep up to date and, and have a way of connecting with each other. So we started the maternity hour and we're still going. So I, w I should have said we're on season 11 and this is session seven. So it's amazing. Now, we're supported by Matflix, who record everything for us. And they keep everything in a huge archive that's getting massive now. Um, and those are accessible to everybody. You can either have a subscription through your institution, which is a really good way of accessing everything, or you can access it for free going into Matflix and you'll see the list, the uh, link on your resources page. But if you want something more focused, we do do box sets and you can subscribe to them. And those box sets are pulled together by our lovely Dr. Jenny Hall, who also puts lots of little extras in those box sets. So they're well worth doing if you're trying to do um, quite a focused project or a dissertation um, or an assignment for your course. Really useful. Very, very good for up to datedness of your of your revalidation. So I'd I'd really recommend those to you. The free to access. If you don't have a subscription, you can still get them. Perfect for study and you can share. And tonight we're going to have a really interesting session with Stephanie. And please do share it with your colleagues. You'll get a recording of this. So take the opportunity maybe to have a session in the coffee room or just have a chat with your colleagues over coffee or lunch and just say what you've learned, because that'll help stick it in your brain but also get the discussion going and that's really welcome to us i want to say a big thank you to our mid our lovely midwives our lovely student midwives our maternity care support workers the doulas that support us and mums and families with us but mostly the our nhs co colleagues who are working really hard as always making sure that there's quality care for mothers and babies so a big thank you to them 
And I also want to say to you individually, look after yourselves because you're really important and you need to look after yourselves just as you look after other people. Now, I'm just going to just skip through some of the news. Now, I mean, there's terrible news from Gaza and Israel. It's really sometimes just too difficult to bear. And my, our thoughts and prayers are with all of those who are affected. It's just, it's difficult to comprehend what it must be like there. Um, so spare a thought and a prayer for all at all. I just hope there's peace soon for all of the people. And it's gained well for those people. It's really difficult. Okay, I'm moving to lighter things now. It's this mo month is not just November, it's November the 1st, but it's Movember, which is Men's Mental Health Awareness Month. And we do have men around the place, both as midwives and doctors, and also our, our dads and partners. So it's good to be aware of that. There'll be activities around. And if you follow Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, you'll probably know a lot about the, those. And again, share with your colleagues. That's a really useful thing to do. Tomorrow is National Stress Awareness Day. Well, that's a good thing to know about. So look after yourself, especially tomorrow. It's Guy Fawkes Day at the end of the week on the 5th. Um, and then I've got all the little newsy bits. So we've got the UK COVID inquiry underway. And we do need to remember that it's there's a lot in the news, but it's also can bring up some very sad and uncomfortable experiences for people who've lost people and experienced illness or have long COVID. So we need to be sensitive to that. Right. There's also these are things that I've been picking up this week. I, I'm full of really good things and they're all on the resources list. There's a great systematic review that shows that women who book for a home birth, however or wherever they give birth eventually are, are less likely to have a cesarean section, less likely to have an instrumental birth, 70% less likely to have an epidural, 40% less to have a third or fourth degree tear, and that's really important, and 60% less likely to need oxytocin augmentation so that's an interesting article i'd commend it to you on the list there's a really good roundup article on the week for maternity services from our own neil stewart have a look at that too it's it, it's not um, it's got lots of figures in it but it's very readable and it it helps understand a lot of the stuff that's going on in the news okay also, I would recommend if you don't subscribe to a nice the nice newsletter, do join it because every week you get a little newsletter and not every week will there be anything directly applicable to midwifery maternity, but often there is. And that can be really useful. So there is a link in that to the CQC state of care report for this year now that's everything that's all health and social care but it does include maternity services but if you download it beware you don't print the whole thing unless you really want it because it's 157 pages you really want i think it's page 41 to 47 that's the maternity services very interesting there's also some focus on trauma in the news and there's a hansard link in the resources um, and there's also, I put an interesting article, improving discussions with pregnant women about previous trauma. Uh, you know, that's something as a midwife, you tend to do when you're booking, you talk about the, the previous experience. And often a lot of experienced midwives will know women will share things that have happened to them. And it's a really good time to do that. So that's an interesting article. Oh, right. I'm almost breathless from all of that news. But do have a look at the resources. There's loads and loads this week and you can't read them all. <laughs> you can't read them all by next week, but there's a lot of good stuff there. Right. I'm now going to move to our main event this evening. And I'm really delighted to welcome Stephanie Michaelides, who I've been invited several times to come and speak with us. But she's a really busy person. Now, many of you will know Stephanie. She's a senior lecturer in midwifery and neonatal care at Middlesex University. She was originally a nurse, worked in A&E and intensive care. She then became a neonatal nurse and then she thought something was missing. So she became a midwife. And then 
she decided she needed to change things for mothers and babies in a real way, especially the babies, very close to Stephanie's heart. So she became a teacher. And her passion was then funneled into developing the neurobehavioral physiological assessment of the neonate. Now, that is examination newborn, but that's the whole holistic examination in those words. And I use those words because that's what it used to be called way back in 1994 when Stephanie first introduced this. And it became like a template for people to use to help teach those skills that would normally be doctor's type skills, like listening to the, the heart with the stethoscope, like looking at the eyes, the red reflex, all of those things. And to help them and it was a huge project and one day we'll get Stephanie come and talk about that project itself because it was it was very complex first in the UK and it's developed now further because obviously alongside the NMC standards of proficiencies for midwives which stipulates that we as midwives need to be familiar with examining the newborn top to toe properly um it needed changing and in integrating into the three year and the 18 month or two year um course for stu students who are already nurses or for uh, direct entry so that's becoming kind of change it's not the mbpn anymore and i know stephanie will probably mention it anyway and one of the things you need to know about stephanie is she's always worked interchangeably in the university and clinical area. So she's very familiar in either setting. Um, and sh this evening, she's going to share some of the principles, providing information to mothers and families, focusing on the examination of newborns. So welcome, Stephanie. Thank you so much for coming this evening. And the screen is now yours. Thank you, Sue, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you for inviting me to come and talk to the examination of the newborn and the education of the parents. Before I start, the, uh, the I need to begin by stating what I mean by the systematic examination, because I think terminology is interchangeable. First, you mentioned NIPE, and NIPE is a screening for only four areas, which I was part, along with developing the examination of the newborn, I was partly, I was also part of the development of NIPE. And when we developed NIPE, we were very, very clear that it was a screening for heart tested hips and eyes, only those four areas. However, as you said, the NMC standards now have asked us to review the baby as part of our everyday practice. And that is stated within the NMC standards as the systematic assessment of the newborn. The NMC standards, uh, unlike the NIPE, which is a one-off assessment, the NMC standards talk to the examination of the baby on the continuum from birth to six weeks of life. The NMC standards also ask us to look at the baby both from a social, psychological and educational point of view. Our role is to review the history, which we're going to talk about within the next half an hour, and identify clinical risk, stroke red flags. I'm never quite sure. We always change the words, but I think now is red flags. And then go forward after we identify the clinical risk and go forward and assess the baby from head to toe. That head to toe assessment, which was deemed as a systematic assessment of the newborn, includes the night screening. So night screening doesn't stand on its own, it's part of the systematic assessment. Following that systematic assessment from top to toe, including night, we then come to a conclusion as to what is the outcome. Is there any immediate care the baby requires? And then we go forward to the continued plan of care to follow that baby through. We next need to consider the fact that we now need to consider the baby after it's been examined. What does that examination consist of, which I'm going to come to? And some people, there is a confusion that this systematic examination of the newborn is a discharge examination. And yes, to some degree, to a lot of babies who will be going home within the hour, it is a discharge examination. However, for the majority of babies who are going to go home two or three or four hours later or the following day, 
The baby needs to be reviewed again by the midwife, as you see on this slide, who will be sending the parents home before the baby goes home. It's important to hear that and listen because we can't just send the baby home. I was part of the chair um, along with Janet Redding that looked at jaundice and the babies who developed connectors were babies who were seen in the clinic, what we would call with a systematic examination from head to toe. That babies then went home in the afternoon, but nobody actually reviewed that baby again. Although the mother said when she was questioned, the baby did look yellow in the afternoon when it wasn't yellow in the morning. So it's very important that we follow the reports that are given and work with them. And that means within the hour, yes, it can be seen as the baby going home, that's adequate, but more than an hour, we need to review the baby again. Now we come to language again. And the language we use for babies going home has changed since NICE guidelines. We used to talk to the mother and baby being discharged to the community. The word that NICE guidelines now talk to is that we are transferring the baby from hospital to the community. So the word that I'm gonna be using throughout this presentation from the baby going from hospital to the community is transfer. Now, when do we transfer babies to home? Well, we transfer the babies to home, of course, as we all know, when the baby's well enough. But apart from the baby being well enough, we also need to recognize, and as I'm gonna be talking through, how much information does the mother have in order to support the care of that baby and make sure that the environment at home is as safe as the one in hospital? And if it's a second baby, lots of mothers have much information and they can teach me and you quite a few things. If it's her, her first baby though, she is brand new to this baby, brand new to the knowledge of what this baby can and can't do. And although they're very keen to go home, once that baby's home, they need the knowledge to make them feel safe and, and confident in the care that they have. And that empowerment includes the information we share with them. When should that inf information begin? Well, hopefully we should begin this information in the antenatal period, because as I go through, the, through this presentation and I won't have time to cover everything, there's a huge amount of information that we need to provide to the mother and relevant others. And to actually bombard her with a lot of information while she's in the hospital in the short time she is, she will absorb some, but not all. So we need to consider ways, and maybe some of you have already got excellent ways to share that information. I used to make sure, and I still do, that we make the information in short spaces throughout the, each visit to make sure the mother, when she hears the information again in the second time, it is the second time she's hearing it. Giving it to her in the antenatal period, it also gives her time to consider that information, go on the web, discuss the choices she has with relevant others, so she feels prepared when she becomes comes into labor. It's very important that we undertake and recognize a very important part of the assessment of the newborn and the systematic assessment of the newborn, the foundation to that assessment is the history. And truly that history, without that history, that examination is not very safe. It's important, and for the students who are on this call, and I know quite a few of you are, that you do spend the time to take the history and that we as midwives give you the time to do that before you actually get to examine that baby because the history will guide you as to what care that baby will require. It's important to also recognize in order to get the true history, we need to provide the mother with the right environment to give her confidentiality and safety to give that information. And I don't know about outside London, but inside London, we have a lot of dialects and it's to use the different available lines language lines and interpreters we have to our, our service to help us speak to the parents because without education that baby and that mother will not be as safe as they could be. It's also important to think of the language you use and to keep talking to a father and not partner because the father and partner may be two different people. Normality. Well, we can have a whole day discussing normality, but the important thing I'm trying to get across here is the fact that this baby in utero didn't have anything to do for himself except swim away in lycor. <laughs> and once he's catapulted into the postnatal world, he now has to adapt and do everything for itself. 
Well, that doesn't happen within the first few minutes of life or the first hour. It takes hours, days. In fact, it takes 48 hours plus for that baby to transition to postnatal life. Unfortunately, we don't have um, um, sort of a looking glass into the baby to know that he's actually transitioned. So we know the most major transitions can take up to 10 days. So therefore, it's important to recognize that each assessment we undertake on this baby, including whether you want to call it NIPE or the systematic examination, it only assesses that baby for that moment in time. That is valuable information for the mother to have, to be empowered to consider the fact that if after I've examined her baby, and I make sure I say that to her, the baby within an hour or a day or so doesn't look so well. Not to think, oh God, I'm an inexperienced mother. It must be me. I must be the one that um, my baby's probably all right. Stephanie said the baby was okay, so it must be. No, we need to empower her to recognize the earlier she tells us of any concerns, the quicker we can act and minimize harm to that baby. We now need to consider the episodes in which we examine babies, and I'm missing one, which I would talk to in a minute. We examine babies at birth, and then we examine the babies at one hour. Hopefully every baby gets that one hour because we need that baby to have that uninterrupted hour with his mother. And then we're going forward from that hour, one hour assessment, producing a care plan of what we would like that baby to be seen. Some babies will require to be seen three hourly, six hourly, whatever that time interval is between that first birth assessment of the follow up. When it gets to the uh, 72 hours, the baby will require to undertake what we all know, a systematic assessment of the newborn, which includes the NIPE. Now it says 72 hours, but I wonder how many of us examine the baby close to 72 hours, because most of the babies that I examine in London are going home in far less than 24 hours. So they're really only just beginning the transition. So education to the mother is vital. Then depending on what time, uh, I transfer the baby back to the ward midwife who would then transfer the baby to the community. Now in the community, the baby will then be examined at regular intervals. I'll put those episodes up because sometimes my student midwives think they've been trained just to undertake that systematic examination within the 72 hours. No, we are there to continually support that baby from the birth to every visit that we actually undertake. So please take, take time to learn from each care episode that you provide to that baby. What information does the mother require? Well, she requires quite a bit, but I've put some of the main points here. And if I haven't covered everything you want to know, please add them in the chat and I will do my best to answer them at the end of this discussion. Then she needs to know that we'll be undertaking the APGAR score and we'd be doing that, making sure that the environment is nice and warm, whether it's home or hospital. And she also needs to be asked and consent as to when we actually clamp the cord. When we clamp the cord, on the whole, the majority of babies will be perfectly normal and will actually will be great to give them at least three minutes before clamping the cord. However, if it's an infant of a diabetic mother or a baby that's interuterine growth restricted or other babies, while I'm doing the APGAR score within one minute and I'm assessing and drying the baby, if I recognize when that lovely baby is, is crying like this one above that first, uh, that first picture and it goes beet through red, I recognize that he's polysarthemic and will not benefit for any extra blood and I will clump the cord early as quickly as I can. Now, I can't be doing that if I haven't actually discussed this with the mother earlier. And hopefully I will make time to do that. I must do that. Otherwise, the mother would think that I'm not following her birth plan. Then we also need to be thinking about how we reduce the stress of the mother regarding resuscitation. And resuscitation equipment and an area for resuscitation needs to be undertaken, both if it's at home or hospital. And we need to tell the mother the basics of the resuscitation process and what it would involve and explain the equipment. Give her the confidence to know. And I have to tell you, throughout my years of experience over 30 plus, 
that the mothers get very stressed, but they feel confident and that stress is reduced if they know the practitioners who are helping their baby know what they're doing. We do the same if we have a relative in hospital. Once we feel confident in the, in the doctors and nurses, we are much more or less stressed than if we didn't. The other big area to consider straight after birth is what you see on my second picture, that lovely skin-to-skin -skin care that that baby's receiving with his mother and father. And hopefully there's a midwife and should be a midwife in the background to make sure that it is safe skin-to-skin -skin care. And that comes from the guidelines given to us by BAPM. And I'm sure many people on this call are aware of them. If not, please look at them. You will be given a resource um, sheet that gives you all the websites and the evidence that I've used for my talk. And it's important to be aware of that because we need to make sure that we share that information with the parents. And the main thing I try and do with everything that I teach is not to make scare the parents into, into not doing something that is so beneficial to the baby. And skin to skin is both to mother and baby. So I need to provide the information in a way that will support the baby and also support the mother to make the right decision. And that's to say to her, and if you give her information in a way that she can visualize what could happen, she's much more likely to follow. And the way I describe the safe skin to skin care, one of the things I get across to the mother is the fact that the baby's airway is very different to the one of the adult. The baby's airway gets narrower at, at, at the upper airway. So what I normally say to her is, imagine your baby's airway as a big straw. And as the baby takes air through his nose, as long as the straw is straight, the baby will get all the air into his lungs. If the baby's chin goes towards his chest, that straw will bend over. And therefore, very little, if any, air would get into those baby's lungs. So it's very important that you do not use your mobile phone. You do not take your baby's eyes off that baby and continually observe. And that's why the BAPM guidelines have asked us to continually observe the baby while he's having skin-to-skin -skin care. Now, when you read those guidelines, you will recognize it's not just skin-to-skin -skin care that causes postnatal collapse and babies having to be resuscitated. There are many other things, but they do highlight skin-to-skin -skin care. The other issue that the mother needs to have, and I'm sure we all do, is the discussion on vitamin K. And I'm always asked, and when I teach the examination in newborn, I'm always asked what is true informed consent. And true informed consent isn't, do you like to have vitamin K orally or IM? Of course, that's a question to be asked. But before we get to that point, we need to make sure we understand what is vitamin K deficiency, early, classic, and late. And I would know what mothers will be at risk of early because of the history that I have and will take a car, um, appropriate action to give it appropriately and monitor that baby. And also with classic and also recognize that the late is also a huge problem because the late will bleed into the poor baby's brain as well as his abdomen. So it's vital that the mother understands vitamin K deficiency and how to monitor her baby for her to give informed consent. Now, when I say which preparation, I mean, do, does, do I recognize which, per, which drug, which vitamin K does my trust provide? Is it vitamin K preparation that has the beef extract in it, or is it the vegetarian one? Now, if it's the vegetarian one, there's no need to be concerned as to whether the mother has special needs, uh, special dietary needs. But if, she, if it doesn't, and if we're using the beef extract, we need to make sure that if she is a vegetarian, we need to make sure that preparation is available to give to her baby when the baby's born. Then we come to discussing when does the baby have his first feed? And that seems to be something we will be discussing with the mother. That's a given. Now, the first feed, if the mother's breastfeeding, can be as soon as the mother feels comfortable to do so and that the baby's ready. That's at, at any time. However, if the baby is to be artificially fed, we need to take into consideration several things. One being, is the baby able to take the artificial feed? 
And I'm not being judgmental or against artificial feed. I'm very much in supporting mother in whatever decision she wishes to make and make sure she's successful in both to enable, to enable that baby to have a safe, well, a safe outcome. With artificial feeding, though, I need to know quite a bit, and I haven't got the time to go through it now. But the main points to go through is, number one, I need to make sure that that baby has no signs of respiratory distress and is alert and ready to take that feed. Not only that, but I need to make sure prior to giving that baby the feed that the baby's GI tract is intact. What do I mean by that? Does the baby have a cleft palate? Did I note that in the notes that the baby had polyhydramnios or when I ruptured the membrane, was I swimming in lyco? If that was the case, I know that I can't give the baby artificial feed until I pass a nasogastric tube and get it x-rayed, depending on my hospital policy. And then I would give the baby artificially feed. But the, I haven't finished. I need to also make sure something that is happening that shouldn't happen. Babies are going home with an anus that is not patent. We need to make sure from the mouth to anus, the GI tract is patent and can take the milk. Second, is another very important point that the mother should be told. And that is that babies do not use the breast just for food any more than they use the bottle just to get the milk. They use sucking to support them to get over the discomfort and pain following birth. So they will suck. And as long as they're breastfeeding, they cannot overfeed and they will, they will take it to their own speed. That is the best way, and we know that, and I don't have to teach you that. However, that's the same with a bottle. If you give the baby a full bottle, sometimes that baby, because it's so much discomfort and, and pain, he will actually finish half the bottle, not because he's hungry, but because he's trying to relieve the pain. So it's very, very important that I actually teach the mother not to give the baby more than about 10 to 50 mils in the first day at every feed of three to four hours. Another important part of examination in newborn that I've learned some years ago when I met Brazadon, I don't know how many have read his work and he's an amazing pediatrician. He's done an amazing amount of research on maternal infant interaction and the behavior of the baby. And he talks to making sure that we understand the behavior in order to work with the baby uh, in partnership. For example, he talks to the fact that if the baby is in deep sleep or light sleep, we should not be touching that baby. We should be leaving it alone and gently wake the baby up to sleep state three before we do anything with it. And that information needs to be given to the mother as well to successfully breastfeed. Because if we tell that mother that that baby needs to feed three hourly, she will go up to a baby in deep sleep, pick it up and try and put it to the breast. And if she does that, we know because we've been there, done that, the baby will start to cry within a very short space of time. And she thinks she can't breastfeed her baby when in actual fact, we haven't taught her how to understand the behavior of her newborn baby. An experienced mother would know that and an experienced one need to be taught. And I've got a short video to show you how to recognize the baby from deep sleep and how to gently wake the baby up from deep sleep. Before I put the video on, can I just share with you the wonderful way that this baby's wrapped. It allows that baby to be cocooned with the warm air that he produces around him rather than be swaddled and he's got his feet at the end of the bed. Now, the first thing I would do up to any baby is observe how he's in his cot. And before I leave the baby after the examination, I will put him back in the cot and make the cot as you see here to show the mother how to support her baby, both with his breathing and with his hip development. This is the best way to have the baby. Now, going up to a baby before we actually touch, Everyone here on this call who is experienced in the examination of the newborn will know the observation is very, very important. It's sometimes more important than palpation and auscultation. It would give us an awful lot of information. So it's important to look to see what sleep state the baby is in. And if like this baby at this moment in time, the baby's in sleep state. Begin by counting the respiratory rate in the... You would see that the baby 
Can you see? The baby's waking up and moving, as you can see. Now, when we want to count the respiratory rate, it's important to get a baseline on what's normal. And that means that we do it without touching the baby. At this moment, it's a good time to do it before you touch and try and move the baby to a table or resuscitate to examine. And to also make sure the mother's watching you, because what you're going to be doing in a short while when I'm going to be speaking is showing her how to monitor the baby's breathing for when we ask her to do something a little later on. And to teach her where to look for the breathing and to make sure she understands is the abdominal area and diaphragm, not the upper chest that she needs to look at. In the same way that we need to teach our students to do that. We shouldn't be using a stethoscope or putting our hand on the baby to get, a, to get the baby to give us a respiratory rate. We need to do it with an untouched method. Okay, let's go to the next one. And this is the next, sorry, just my computer's playing up. Okay, so we're now to systematic examination, the newborn which hopefully would have given that information to the mother antenatally so she's had time to look, plus the night screening that would be included within it so she knows what we're actually doing. She would know that we're going to be examining the baby from head to toe and why we want to do it. Why do we want to examine her baby or every baby? And the main things that I concentrate on giving more information on are the things that I've found over the years the mother finds difficult watching. And that's the examination of the mouth. As you know, we don't just digitally examine the mouth now. We also need to use the spatula to review the soft palate. Now, putting a spatula into the baby's mouth when he's moving is not going to be very safe. So I need her support to hold the baby's head while I insert the spatula and look to the back of the baby's throat. So I, I need to recognize the importance of that assessment and how she can help me. I also need her to understand why I'm examining both her female and male genitalia, including the examination of the testes. And then I also need to explain about the hips. Now the hips is an issue because where the other two are not really uncomfortable for the baby, hips can be. If you're inexperienced and it takes some time to get to the hips because to do the hips, we're examining the baby from head to toe, we're turning the baby over, examining the spine and then going to the hips. But then if we're taking quite some time, more up to about 15 minutes to do so, that baby will start to object and the mother will start feeling uncomfortable if her baby's crying and she thinks the baby's in pain. She needs to recognize that the baby isn't in pain. In fact, it shouldn't be in pain. If he is, we're not doing it correctly. It's If you do it within five, 10 minutes, most babies will not mind, but take some babies would. And she needs to understand the importance of the hip assessment. Not only does she need to understand this assessment, but also recognize it's vital that that baby gets the follow-up at six to eight weeks to make sure that the baby hasn't developed a problem in the meantime. Another big area that people who know me on this call would recognize is the importance of the one-to-one -one communication with the baby. Now, I always say to the mother that I will speak to her before and after I finish the physical assessment, but at doing the physical assessment, I'm going to give my 110% concentration on that baby because that baby is speaking to me throughout the physical assessment. And I don't want to miss a single word that he's saying because he will help me identify any problem she or he may have. For example, look at this lovely baby on this slide. I mean, I mean, the babies we examine, they're so privileged and they're so lovely. They're amazing. Look at this one. He's telling me already that he's well. The video isn't on, but I can tell you that he has no respiratory distress. He's warm. He's giving me beautiful eye-to-eye -eye contract. He's almost hypnotized. <laughs> I'm hypnotized with him. And I can see that his eyes are clear. And even more importantly, even more amazing, this is a newborn baby less than 24 hours. He's identified where his mouth is. And he's recognized by sucking his finger, he will feel less discomfort. So he's going ahead and sucking his finger and consoling himself. How wonderful is that? You need to share your amazement of this baby with the mother and she can carry on feeling less scared of this brand new baby. We need to concentrate and consider reviewing this babies and talking to the mother about successfully breastfeeding and the importance of recognizing if the baby's 
well between the 9th and 91st centile, they should, uh, if they're well, not require any top-ups. Sometimes the mother may think that the baby's crying and he needs more than what she can actually provide. You need to explain to her how glucose metabolism functions and how it's there for every baby for the first two days while her milk is coming in. And physiologically, the better, the less the baby's getting in the first 48 hours and the amount of colostrum that she's producing is perfect for her individual baby. And we shouldn't be encouraging her to have any top-ups just to satisfy our needs that this baby's getting something. Because the only time we should be giving any top-ups to any baby is if it's medically indicated. Otherwise, we are taking away the safety net that nature has provided for that specific baby. Then we need to think of jaundice. Now, as I said, jaundice is something we're getting better with and we recognize early. Sometimes, though, we need to also consider late. And I know all of us recognize that late is perfectly normal in a large number of babies. But again, going back to what I said before, a few babies will not be necessarily normal. And the thing, one of the things, there's a couple, but one of the things that we need to exclude if the baby continually is jaundice after 14 days is biliary atresia. And that's the yellow alert that the second slide shows that you can find on the web as well. And that is picking them up early before they're two to three months of age, because if you delay picking that up, that baby will end up with having to require a liver transplant. And that's not an easy thing to have to do. So just be aware of what is early, what is late, and what information we need to share with the mother. Now we come back to cardiac changes. And if you remember, and if we all go back to understanding the hemoglobin, the fetal hemoglobin of a baby, we all should remember, and the students amongst you need to understand is, fetal hemoglobin makes the baby show cyanosis as a late sign. The baby can desaturate down to 75% and still look pink. So therefore, it's very, very important that you do not take cyanosis as your first sign and teach the mother one of the early signs. And one of the early signs goes back to that little video, is asking the mother to view her baby before she puts it on the breast or gives it a bottle and look at how quickly the chest is moving up and down. Note that pattern. And then ask her after she's finished feeding her baby and the baby's lying quietly to monitor the speed of breathing again. And if that's a lot faster than before she started, you and I both know that baby's actually in respiratory acidosis and is trying to blow off the CO2 because of some problem, probably cardiac changes. So the quicker you catch that baby and do something, the better the long-term outcome. Cyanosis is an issue. And if you are looking at cyanosis, remember dark skin babies do not show you the cyanosis from the skin. You need to look inside their mouth, their gums, and preferably use a saturation monitor after you've done the cardiac assessment to give you a true indication of the baby's saturation. And infection is another big issue, and we need to be aware of that. Infection is very much of a problem for babies. They get infections of various types. They can be eyes, mouth, um, cord. And the one that we really are concerned about is group B. Now, group B, we all seen and are aware of, as far as the early is concerned. And we can pick it up because they're all in hospital. And if the baby's gonna have a problem, it will show within six hours to 24 hours. Now, any baby that's been treated or any mother that's been recognized to be group B positive needs to be given signs and symptoms of late group B streptococci because that will at attack the meninges. So some hospitals I'm aware, and maybe some on the call, you would know that you give your little mother a little card and you need to explain what those signs and symptoms are. And we need to talk to the other infections as well. Education continues. And as you see, the list is growing. We need to be thinking of why to avoid swaddling the baby and how that affects the development of the hips and how we can support the development of the hip by sleep time and play time. And just remember, playtime means being prone, and we need to teach the mother the same way as we did with skin to skin, how to maintain a clear airway. 
She will need information. I'm sure you all been asked, when can I bath my baby? And remember the importance of where she is. If she's in a hard water area, preferably after five days, if, if she's got a, um, a softener in the house, she can bath the baby not less than 24 hours to allow the baby. Or if she lives in an area where the water is soft, any time after uh, 24 hours. The longer she leaves the baby without bathing, the better. Encourage them not to smoke because that is a huge problem. Blood spot screening, we need her to understand that because I need her to be aware that I'm coming to do it and to prepare by putting maybe an extra sock because I don't have those lovely little heat pads and maybe some of you do have them and maybe you can share where you get them from because they're wonderful in heating the baby's heel to make spot, blood spot screening easier. Not only do I need to do the test, but I also need to explain to the mother the importance of when to receive the result. When I first did the blood spot screening, we used to call it a Guthrie then, I used to hear, say to the mother, and I can hear myself saying this, no news is good news. Well, it's no longer the case because we now know that those cars can get lost. And I thought that I've screened the baby, but maybe this baby has never been screened because that lab has not received the card. Even more importantly that she gets the result is because if a baby is high risk and requires BCG vaccination, that baby will not be able to receive it because it's a live vaccine if it's positive to skids. Now, the NICE guidelines talk to the Lullaby Trust baby check. And some of you are using that already. And hopefully we are going to all be using it because it's a wonderful little um, teaching tool that parents can have. You, they can download it onto their phones. And I think it's in multi-language. And they can actually be asked 19 simple questions and the yes or no answer will give a score. That score that you see on the right of your slide indicates whether that baby's well or whether that baby requires to be seen by a doctor quite soon. Now, safeguarding was raised even more during the pandemic, as Sue said. And we had more babies admitted in A&E with safeguarding issues. But we need to prepare for all our parents. And if the mother's going home to lots of support, less of a problem, but still maybe give her that support, treat all the same. But if she's a single mom going home on her own, she's going to sometimes end with a baby that is her first baby, no knowledge, with the baby continually crying. She's had no sleep. She's more likely to find the whole process very stressful. And we need to minimize that by giving her the support guidance, the, the, the helplines that she could actually contact, including ourselves. But one of the other things that we can do during the systematic examination of the newborn is make sure that when we're reviewing the eyes, and remember NIPE only looks for cataracts, we look for the systematic assessment for many things, including the, um, the subcontractile hemorrhages. And we need to record both when they're present and very importantly, very importantly, if they're not there, because it's quite normal physiological finding straight after birth not when the baby's 10 days of age and you go in and you discover that baby didn't has actually now developed one because it means that he was probably shaken. Record keeping, why is that important? Because it supports continuity of care. Some of you on this call are very lucky to provide continuity of care teamwork and you that mother sees you and maybe one other person. But in my experience, both in hospital and the community, we have very few continuity teams. And hopefully with time, maybe we can increase that. But in the meantime, the support continuity of care for that baby is our records. The plan that we have put in after each visit will support the person that goes in after me. And it also means that the mother will have that information. So if I said to her, your baby is fine, but tomorrow I would like to come in and do a TCB, a test to see if your baby's jaundice. If I don't arrive, she is my safety net to ring up and say, Stephanie, you were supposed to come in. Why haven't you? Or if I'm not there, somebody else will be alerted to go in and support that baby's follow-up plan of care. And if we have any, any issues, we need to record them. To finish, 
we need to recognize that we have to take some takeaway messages and maybe from your discussions, we can add to this list. We need to listen and act on the mother's concerns. Before I start on the systematic examination of the baby, I always say to the mother, can you tell me which area of the baby would you like me to focus in? Because she will be like a Sherlock Holmes with a magnifying glass, going through her baby like anything. And if there's anything wrong with that baby, that mother would know. And not only do I ask the question, but I listen to the answer and follow through and give her a reply to whether her concerns are valid or not. And I have to tell you, most of the time they're valid. We need to think about when we do we start education. Maybe consider doing workshops, not just on breastfeeding, but on neonatal care and time them throughout antenatal. And if we don't do it antenatally, maybe we can have a workshop by the appropriate professional in the postnatal ward and give them one hour workshop before they go home. That would be very, very valuable. Share with the parents the websites, feel confident and competent in the assessment of the newborn because if I'm not confident or competent in that assessment, how do I teach my students? How do I teach the mother to take on board the information? Because it needs to be adapted to the individual for them to take on board the amount of information we are providing. We need to tell the mother not whether she would like one thing or another, but why? What does each action that I do, what does it mean for her baby? And what are her choices, two choices? And then go forward and make sure that we document and make sure that we make sure that she understands who to actually contact if she does have any concerns. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I know it's a lot, a lot to share and it I always love listening and I always think if I was a new mum I'd love to have Stephanie in my cupboard I could just take her out and say what do I do now um, and I can I can I know that people are, are, are asking questions I think one of the biggest things is people think how can you give women all that information but having heard Stephanie when she's done an examination she always spends a lot of time sitting down with the mum and it's a it's a kind of teaching, a lovely teaching activity with the mum. So I know I know how Stephanie works. Now we have a few questions. Now I'm looking away at my other screen because I have two screens. Um so because the, the questions are coming through. And I'm going to start off with a question which I think is almost relevant to what I've just said, which is from Nana or Nana who's a student midwife. Hi, Nana. I hope that's correctly sent. Um, and she says, how do we relay this information antenatally without scaring the life out of women about their birth stroke resuscitation? So I think that was the area around the resuscitation area, Stephanie. Do you like uh, to answer right. that one? The resuscitation, I know we all find difficult, but as a student, if you watch your midwives explaining, it's very helpful to say to her that the majority of babies will be healthy, including hers. But it's like everything in life. If we are prepared, it's less of a problem than if we are not. So it doesn't mean because I am getting ready for resuscitation, the baby's going to be resuscitated. It doesn't necessarily mean that. The majority of babies, in reality, would do very well without us. It's just the few we need to be prepared for. Brilliant. I hope that's helped, Nana. Okay, I've got a question from Fiona. In fact, Fiona's got two questions. I'm not sure if it's the same Fiona, but I suspect so. And Fiona says, hello, Fiona. Uh, it's our local policy to refer all firstborn females delivered by cesarean section for routine hip scan. The opinion is that there is increased risk of hip dysplasia What's your opinion about this routine practice? So this is females delivered by cesarean section. And as I say, it's amazing that your hospital has the resources to do that. <laughs> it is true that females have a higher risk and it's, and it's excellent that they're taking that precaution to do that. And I'm surprised you have enough service to achieve it. Congratulate them. Well done. Okay. <laughs> Well, that's good, isn't it? Nice. It's nice yes. as, a, as a positive thing. Yes, for the service. Well, well, Fiona has another question. And now Fiona says, "Can you briefly outline benign sleep 
myoclonus. Parents often demonstrate stress and anxiety when they witness this. Yes. That's the sort of a shaking um, action that can be deemed as seizures that the baby does or uh, does naturally. And when you wake the baby up, they just disappear. Just tell the baby, tell the parents, sometimes they would actually do that themselves when they're woken up from a deep sleep. It's a natural occurrence that takes place and it's not really anything to be worried about. Oh, is that when you feel as though you're falling and you go? Yes, that's right. And you oh. just have this shaking. Oh, and okay. I have, I have. when I first started midwifery, I have to say when I first saw it, I got a senior registrar to come and see the baby because I thought he was having seizures. And I scared <laughs> the poor parent saying, this is, your baby's got a little bit of a headache and I'm just going to get the doctor to come and have a look. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the first time I started to learn about that. But oh, yes, wow. as long as you're sure that's happening because of sleep, yes. But there's nothing wrong, absolutely nothing wrong if you're not sure to ask for a second opinion. It's the same with the parents. If they have a concern, there's nothing wrong with raising it and for us to look to make sure it's nothing, it's something benign and nothing very, very problematic. And when you start to examine a baby for the first time, I know that is like doing your first birth. You want somebody with you. And it takes quite a while before you gain that confidence to say that's normal, that's abnormal. So you need to be working with your midwives and work, don't worry about how many times you ask for a second opinion. The more, the better. People used to know me whenever I was on duty, they used to say, the registrar used to say, are you on duty today? And I would say, okay, then I'll make sure I'm available because he knew <laughs> <laughs> I used to have to call him. So, yes, do not worry. Refer if you're in doubt. No problem. But, I mean, actually, that's really nice, Stephanie, because if we're all asking our colleagues, do you know, what do you think about this? And it actually shares different things and helps us and helps them. And, you know, even doctors can learn. Absolutely. And, and we yeah. should be supporting yeah. each other like yes. that so that's lovely thank you stephanie okay now we've got oh my goodness we've got lots of comments i'm just checking there's not any more questions but i hope fiona that's okay with you we've got a comment and i have to send hugs out to argentina we've got argentina with us this oh, evening how lovely. and oh, that's lovely. laura laura Quevedo. So hi, Laura, and we're hugs back to you from us too. It's lovely from Argentina. And we've got uh, some comments. Sarah Smith, she's saying, this is fantastic. Really enjoying it. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you, Sarah. And Leela Brad Badaway, that was brilliant. Thank you for that. Lisa Brown, amazing. Thank you. Marina Acala Escamila, what a lovely session. Thank you so very much. Thank oh, how lovely. Much. Thank you. Oh, no, this one's lovely. Leela Badaway says, so educational. Wish she was my teacher. Oh, how nice. Thank oh, you. <laughs> you'll make Stephanie blush if you're not careful. Maybe I should go online and do some <laughs> tutorials online. <laughs> oh, you'd be you'd be very busy, I think. OK, <laughs> now, and we've got uh, Carol Goddard says, thank you very much, Stephanie. Laura Quevedo says, thank you very much. This is very helpful. I think I've said that already. And Christina, Christine Tre Trezies Neil, thank you very much for a very interesting hour. We always learn something new, no matter how experienced one is. Absolutely, Christine, that is absolutely so. And Jill Phillips says, could I ask more about the routine screening of serious heart conditions? Has this changed at all over the last 10 years or so? I may have missed this. I think this might be a big question, Jill. What do you think, Hello, Stephanie? Jill. Thanks for asking that very important question. Now, the examination of the heart hasn't changed over the years and is the same, but I think the way that some people have been teaching it has been slightly different. So it depends where you've done your course, and that's something within London. We have uh, pan-London teachers that all meet together to identify one tool that we all, whichever university you come through, you'd learn the systematic examination of the newborn because we recognize there is a variety of courses out there. There's a variety of way to teach things. So we have come together and agreed one way to teach all our students so there's less of confusion and it supports the clinical staff. In regards to the examination, as far as NIPE is concerned, if you go on to NIPE, it gives you a very nice readout and a very nice um, videos on the examination of the newborn. 
just for your interest, NIPE is in the process of reviewing the cardiac assessment and will actually be producing those guidelines probably by April next year to tell us okay. the exact way to go forward to examine the heart. But there is only one specific way, and that's looking at observation of the baby, looking at um, palpation of the baby, looking at capillary filling time, brachial, femoral pulses, and comparing the brachial and the femoral for delay is looking at the baby overall, the well-being of the baby, then going to auscultation of the different areas to identify any murmurs. But as I said earlier, that examination that we undertake in 24 hours, the duct is still wide open and the coaptation of the aorta will not show any signs and symptoms mm -hmm. until after 48 hours when it begins to close. So remember to keep monitoring that baby after that first initial assessment continuously and to at least 10 days. I hope that's answered your question, Jill. Fabulous. Thank you, Stephanie. And Chris, Chris Warren, hi, Chris, says it was new to hear about the use of the spatula for looking at the baby's palate. I thought you felt with a finger. Can you explain? Right, that we used to use just our finger, but, uh, oh God, I've forgotten the year. Sue, can you remember the year that we had the guidelines to say that somebody on the call will probably put it on the chat, but I've forgotten the year. It's quite a number of years now, at least, must yeah. be at least five years now. I think but so. We've been yeah, asked to right. review the soft palate, not just with our finger, because we could easily miss a soft palate that's not intact. So we have to visualize it with a spatula and a torch. So yes, that's been in position. The nice it's been adapted and accepted by nice to actually for us mm. to do that. So we haven't really said we can't validate the palettes unless we have done both digital and visual. Okay, there is there is um, a little booklet, and mm. I can't remember the reference. But what we'll do is put it on. The yes. page, uh, yes, that would be great. Yeah, I'll because I that, and you can add it to the page. Yes, please. Yes, because I think we had the consultant talking about it, didn't we? Mm. I remember that yes. now. Fabulous. Yes. Thank you. Here. Yes, thank you very much. Actually, thank you, Chris, for raising that because that's a really important point, and I'll make sure that's is put on the on the page for you. Now I know we're running short of time. We've just got a couple more things. Uma, now Raj, Raj Uma Raj Shankar says, could we say to parents not to swaddle as it restricts the baby's movement? Now, I know Stephanie's answer to this one. Uma. Can I just say, <laughs> swaddling has its place. When you have a really distressed baby, to reduce movement of the limbs is a way to calm the baby down. But to put the baby down swaddle doesn't allow the baby to get stimulation for the medulla mm. to support periodic breathing. And it doesn't help the baby with the development of the hips. So I would suggest that unless you have a reason to swaddle babies, that you don't put them to sleep swaddle. It is not safe for the baby. They can often overheat as well, can't they? Yeah. Not, yeah. yeah. That's a big question as well. But thank you, Uma, for raising that. It's lovely. And we've got some comments. And Gemma says it's wrong that there's a, that there's enough awareness on postnatal care, but yet not enough awareness of, oh, I've lost it. Hang on. Sorry, my thing's moved. And not enough awareness of perinatal depression. Well, that's true, and that's something we do re 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 go into. And it's, I think, the postnatal Absolutely period right. is always yeah, neglected. Right. Whatever. Yes. So, thank you for that, Gemma. And Amanda says, "Where can I read more about skin to skin and baby's airway?" Well, I think you might want to look in the new maze midwifery because there's quite a bit about it in uh, <laughs> Stephanie's chapter on examination newborn, which you should be able to get at your university if you can't access. But let us know if you can't get it and we can send you some more information, Amanda, for that one. Um, a comment from Helene Senior. I hope it will in include pulse oximetry to the examination, Stephanie. Right. And then... Donna Troughton says, I'm in first year at UWS. We have examination newborn on our timetable for next week. This has been so helpful. You're going to be ahead of everything now. I feel much better prepared. Thank you. Well done, Donna, and good luck for next week. You'll enjoy that. Laura says, hi, Laura, very informative session. Thank you very much. And Laura from Cumbria. Oh, we've got Argentina, Cumbria, everything here. And, and Metzka, Skubek. Skubik, sorry, thank you for from Slovenia. 
We are wow. truly international. Wow. We're fabulous. And Maybe Juliet, I can go on holiday on this different. <laughs> to have to show you me could around. do. You could do. Juliet in Essex says, "Good evening, Stephanie. Absolutely brilliant as always. Information delivered and explained, giving the why to reinforce understanding." Joe Solak says, "Thank you very much for explaining how to check respiration rate of newborn babies. Fabulous, Joe." And Helen Gnat says, "Thank you both. Such a help." Oh, wonderful. Such a help in preparing me for my Viva in January. Much appreciated. Well, that's my fabulous. My pleasure. That's, and I think that our questions and comments really have illustrated what a fantastic audience we have. See, there's still, still people coming in now. We'll have to finish this. I'm doing the last one. And this is Matara Martindale Regist Regista. Always enjoy your teaching and thoroughly enjoyed this refresher to get me back on track. Brilliant session. Hopefully see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Stephanie. I think everyone knows Stephanie now. Anyway, I think we have to bring it to this to a close. It's been a lovely hour. And thank you so much to Stephanie for joining us and sharing. I know there's so much information and we we made stephanie just pick looking after the parents information or the mother's information really important part of this so thank you so much for joining us this evening stephanie and thank you also to angelo who's in the background making sure everything runs smoothly and making sure that you'll get your box set and your recording and for those of you at six o'clock in the morning on friday we'll get your podcast on time also, thank you to Paul, who's been sending me the questions and comments. And I think he's been like one of these mad cats typing away very busily. Um, and resources will be available and you get all this on Facebook. We'll ch chase up the, pat the soft palate issue. In the meantime, um, I need to just remind you, don't forget if you're a student midwife to book in for the Student Midwife Experience Festival, 8th of November, London or Midwifery Education Conference on the 15th of November, which is online. Got some fantastic speakers, absolutely superb. And also the Scottish Festival on the 28th of November in Edinburgh. So if you want a little trip to Scotland, we'll be there. Um, in the meantime, stay safe. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week for more. <laughs>